about generally my research area so that you can have uh, uh, context to put this talk into. So I work in the area of analysis, which is a very, very broad area of mathematics. Maybe 30% of mathematicians work in analysis in some sense or other. So it's a big area. It's the uh, mathematics that's at the foundations of calculus. So that's why you often see me teaching calculus. Formal analysis, functional analysis, Fourier analysis, harmonic analysis, or measure theory, that's also an analysis course. Within the area of analysis, I work in harmonic analysis, which is again a very broad area. Uh, on one hand, a very classical area, it dates back to Fourier and his work in the early 1800s, looking at differential equations that arose from his interest in certain equations that arose in physics, such as the heat equation. Today still has important applications in physics, and also very important applications in engineering, in signal and image processing. And I find a lot of engineering students actually study more harmonic analysis than the typical math undergraduate studies. But I don't do applied things. I do very theoretical things. And my work is often motivated by what's known as the uncertainty principle in harmonic analysis, which we stole from the physicists. We stole the phrase. But it's kind of uh, akin philosophically. And it says that you cannot expect to, be, to control well both the time and spectral properties of a function, or both function and its Fourier transform, whatever those things mean. That actually has important physical applications, implications. From an engineering point of view, it, it means in particular that you can't have a compactly supported signal come with bounded frequencies. So if, if that means anything to you, uh, I say it. Um, so what this means in practice is that you cannot have both the function and its Fourier transform simultaneously small, unless they're both identically zero. But it's a very rough rule of thumb. And a lot of work has gone into the last hundred years in trying to quantify that statement and trying to make some very specific theorems to say if you're this small on one side, you can only be this small on the other. And so a lot of my work is motivated by studying objects that are very small. That's kind of what I study, small things. And uh, when I say small, I often mean sets of measure zero. So I'm very interested in sets of measure zero and trying to understand the differences between these sets. And these sets from a classical Lebesgue measure point of view are invisible, effectively, because they're measure zero. So this classical way isn't so helpful necessarily in studying them. And that has led to an interest that I have now in fractal geometry. Because in fractal geometry, they develop, they've developed some techniques which allow us to give a more refined way to understand size. And this allows us to be able to compare um, many sets that we cannot distinguish with the big measure because they're all simply a measure zero. So that's one of my areas of interest and that's the motivation for the talk today. I want to tell you about a few things about Cantor sets or Cantor-like sets that I found interesting and I think they'll be new for the most part to most of you because in fact I think some of these results only came out in the literature in the last year or two. So they should be brand new, at least the last few things that I say in this talk. So with that introduction, let me just start off by saying about, a little bit about Cantor sets here. They were introduced, or I don't know whether you want to say discovered, or created, or invented, whatever you like. Won't get into that debate. By Cantor in 1883. So they've been around torturing students in analysis classes for a long time. <laughs> The, uh, he actually developed these sets when he was working on a harmonic analysis problem that was posed to him uh, by Heine of the heine borel theorem fame. So he was working on a classical problem in harmonic analysis and he, he looked at these Cantor sets. He used them as part of his solution to that problem. And it was this work on that problem in harmonic analysis that led actually to his interest in, in set theory and the development of set theory that he's so renowned for. So I like to think that harmonic analysis should get the credit or maybe you think the blame for the development of set theory. So let me just quickly review the properties of the Cantor sets, and we're all talking about the same thing. Um, the classical Cantor set, if you remember, uh, it's kind of come up a lot in, in real analysis classes because it's 
got such an unusual combination of features. So remember, we start with the interval 0, 1, and then remove from that the middle, open middle third interval. I think I'm going to have to switch pens here already. Uh, we remove the middle third. Can people on this side see? Well, if not, I hope you. right on this since I have a little blackboard here. Okay, so we start off with the interval 0, 1, remove the middle third. Now we're left with two closed intervals, 0 to a third, two thirds to a ninth, uh, two ninth, two thirds to one. And then we repeat the process. We have these two intervals, 0 to one third, two thirds to one. We remove the middle third and keep the two outer intervals again. And now these are 0 to a ninth, 2 ninths, yeah, to 1 third. I shouldn't be writing on this with this marker. That's why it's very hard to read. 2 thirds to 7 ninths and 8 ninths to 1 and so on. Okay, so and now we just keep doing this forever. And each time we take the intervals we had at the previous step, remove the middle third, so we keep the two outer thirds, and repeat. And so what happens is that at step n in the construction, maybe we can form sets that we call Cn. So C1 will be the two intervals, 0 to a third, 2 thirds to 1. And Cn will in general be 2 to the n, closed intervals of length 3 to the minus n. Because each time we do this process of removing the middle third, we double the number of intervals. So that's why we have 2 to the n after n steps. And each time we cut the length of the interval to a third of what it previously was. So they have length 3 to the minus n. And then the Cantor set is the intersection of all these sets. So it's the set that's left over after you do this process of removing middle thirds, keeping the outer two thirds uh, forever. So that's the Cantor set. And there's certainly something left over here because, well, for example, 0 is in every one of the sets Cn. In fact, more generally, once a point becomes an endpoint of an interval, like say one third, from then on it's an endpoint of an interval. One of the intervals that's in the set Cn. And so it is going to be in Cn for every n and therefore is in the Cantor set. So all of these endpoints of intervals, these so-called Cantor intervals, are in the Cantor set. Uh, but those are always numbers that are rational numbers, actually. So they're really, they're a very trivial proportion of the Cantor set because the Cantor set is uncountable. So this is very few of the elements in the Cantor set are actually these endpoints. Okay, so some important properties of the Cantor set. Well, it's closed because it's each set CN is a closed set, being a finite union of closed sets, and bounded because it's in zero one. So it's back. It's what's called a perfect set. Perfect set, for an analyst, is a set in which every point is an accumulation point, which means that there's lots of points in the set very close by, arbitrarily close by, to every point in the set. And the argument for that is simply the following. If you have an x in your Cantor set C, then x is in every Cn. And so it's in one of these little intervals of length 3 to the minus n. So x is, oh, because it might be one of the two endpoints, but it's somewhere in this interval. And both these endpoints are also in the Cantor set. And one of those endpoints is not x. Maybe one is, but one is definitely not. So there's certainly that point that's in, that's not x, is another point in the Cantor set that lies within 3 to the minus n of x. And so there's a point really close by x. And you can do this process at every step n, because x is in every, every cn. So it's perfect. And in that sense, it's a very big set. Because if you just imagine it, every set, every point in the set is really close by lots of other points. So there's a real thickness to this set. But on the other hand, it's a very small set because there's no intervals in this set. <coughs> because if you had an interval of some positive length delta, let's say, well, delta would be bigger than 3 to the minus n for some n. 
And if this interval is supposed to be in the Cantor set, then it's in Cn for every n. Now what's Cn made up of? Two to the n intervals, and what do you have? You have an interval and then a gap that you've removed, and then another interval and a gap you've removed. So if you're going to have an interval sitting inside c to the n, it's going to have to sit inside one of those little subintervals of length 3 to the minus n. But this guy's length was more 3 to the minus n, so that's impossible. So there's no intervals inside the set c. So between any two points in c, something is missing. Because if you've got two points in c, there's got to be something missing because this whole interval can't be in c. So something's been removed. Something's in the complement of C. And then, well, once you have one point in the complement of C, because C is closed, its complement is open, and therefore there's actually an entire interval that's in the complement of C. There's a whole interval here that's in C complement, but it's outside C. So between any two points in C, there's an interval removed. One of the removed intervals is between them. And we say that the set is totally disconnected when it's like that, when, uh, when there's a, a whole interval between any two points in the set has been removed. Well, as I said, the Cantor set is uncountable. One way you could prove that is you could prove a more general theorem that every perfect closed set is uncountable. So that's, that's overkill here because you could just describe the Cantor set in terms of the base three representations. And these are the numbers that you could write you write in terms of powers of 3. So like a binary expansion, we have a ternary expansion where we write in base 3. Every real number in 0, 1 we can write with the digits 0, 1, and 2. And the elements in the Cantor set are those which do not use the digit 1. And the, the idea here is that in the construction of the Cantor set, it's these intervals that we remove that you are going to require digit 1. The, this is 0 times a third plus 1 times a third plus 2 times a third for the first approximation. And so these guys require a digit 1 in their first position. These guys here require a digit 1 in their second position. They're multiple of a 9, and so on. So when you see it like this, then you certainly see it's uncountable, because that's in a 1 to 1 correspondence with the binary representations of numbers in 0, 1. So you see, it's kind of a, a mixed up set, because on one hand, we, we see it as very large. It's uncountable. It's perfect. Every point is an accumulation point or a limit point. But on the other hand, it's very small in that there's no open sets in the set. There's a gap between any two elements in the set. So in that sense, it's very small. And what about the length of this set? Can we make sense of the length of it? Well, I don't know. but. Certainly, I think we can make sense of the length of the set Cm, which come up in the construction, because we know what the length of an interval is. And so if our set is simply a union of intervals, a finite union of intervals, it's natural to say its length is the sum of the lengths of those intervals. And Cm, remember the, in the construction, this is made up of 2 to the n intervals of length 3 to the minus n. So those lengths would add up to 2 to the n times 3 to the minus n or two-thirds to the n, and that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. <coughs> so here we have our Cantor set C. It's sitting inside Cn for every n. So it's got to have even smaller length, right? That's only natural. So its length must be zero, since these sets Cn have length arbitrarily close to zero if you take n large enough. And so we say that the Cantor set has length zero or more formally, measure zero. Does measure zero mean? It means that uh, given any epsilon, we can find countably many intervals such that their union contains the set in question. And if you add up the lengths of those intervals, you get less than epsilon. Well, we can certainly do that with our Cantor set. If, if epsilon is bigger than 2 thirds to the n, you know, take n big enough to make that true. Then we just use those intervals in the construction of the Cantor set at level n. And they add up to less than epsilon. So our Cantor set has measure zero. Of course, lots of sets have measure zero. A finite set has measure zero. Uh, you can cover it with arbitrarily small intervals. A countable set has measure zero. Our Cantor set has measure zero. But the interval zero, one does not have measure zero. There's no way you're going to cover the interval 0, 1 with intervals that add up to length less than epsilon. 
you're not going to make them add up to like less than one. Okay, so that's the classical, sometimes called the classical cantor set or the classical middle third cantor set. But there's many other cantor sets that one could talk about. You know, there's, there's no real reason why we should always be keeping the outer thirds. Why not keep the outer fourths or the outer fifths or the outer one over pies or whatever we like. And so we can have a whole family of cantor sets, CR, where the R is the ratio of dissection or the proportion that we keep of the previous intervals. So we get this whole family of sets. They will all have the same kind of construction as the standard Cantor set. We pull out a middle portion, keeping two outer portions. And so at step N in the construction, they're going to be made up of two to the N, closed intervals, all of which are length, R to the N. And so these ones will all have measure zero as well, because the length at step n in the construction will be at most 2 to the n times r to the n. And we're actually throwing something away, so r is under a half. And so this goes to zero. Yeah. What happens if r approaches a half? Well, it's fixed. Okay. The moment In this example, r is fixed. So r is fixed, and it's a number less than a half. So we really are throwing something away. Otherwise, we wouldn't be losing anything in the construction if r was a half. And all of these sets have the same properties. They're all compact. They're all perfect. They're all totally disconnected. They're all uncountable. They're all at measure zero. And so how do we distinguish these sets? And yet, if you think about it, if instead of keeping the outer third, as I did initially, I keep the outer quarter each time, well, it sure feels like that's a smaller set, because I'm keeping less at each step in the construction. But we're not able to see this by any of the standard ways of understanding size of sets. We're not seeing it by cardinality. They're all uncountable. We're not seeing it by topological reasons, like they're both perfect. They're both totally disconnected. So we're not distinguishing them by that. We're not distinguishing them by their measure. They're all at measure zero. So how can we distinguish their sizes? And this is where fractal geometry becomes useful, because there's a whole notion of so-called fractal dimensions which allows us, well, really, which gives a, a more refined way to talk about size and will, in fact, allow us to distinguish the size of these sets. There's many different fractal dimensions, Box or Minkowski, Hausdorff, packing, energy, capacity, many, 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 depending on you know, which you use, just depends on what kinds of problems you want to do. So I'm just going to mention a couple. And the first one I will mention is box dimension. So what's, what's the idea of box dimension? Very nice one for calculations. We start off with some subset of R, closed and bounded, like the Cantor set. And then for each positive number delta, we calculate the fewest number of intervals of length less than or equal to delta that cover the set E. That means whose union is inside, uh, whose union contains the set E. E is inside the union of those intervals. So it covers in the very natural sense of the word. So for example, if we take the interval 0, 1, and we think about it, how many intervals of length less than or equal to 1 over n are we going to need to cover it, the minimal number? Well, clearly n. We're not going to do it with less than n. We can do it with the interval 0 to 1 over n, 1 over n to 2 to the n, 2 over n, 2 over n to 3 over n, make those n intervals. Okay, so now to calculate the box dimension, you take these numbers n sub delta that you've worked out and uh, take the log of those numbers and then divide by log delta. And if you take a limit as delta goes to zero, if it exists. If it doesn't, well, then maybe we could do then soup and lim and we talk about upper and lower box dimensions. But that's our box dimension, dim sub b of e. Okay? So calculate these numbers, n sub delta, and then we're log, when you take log of it, then you're really looking at thinking about writing n sub delta as delta sum to some power, and we're going to pick out that power. That's what's happening here. So for example, if we take e to be 0, 1, where we saw the number, the least number, n sub 1 over n is little n, well, if you plug that in, you see you get the box dimension is 1 which coincides with our usual idea of dimension for the interval 0, 1. 
almost like a vector space dimension, right? R1. The box dimension is much more general. It will always produce a number for us between 0 and 1. Often 0, often 1. But more interestingly, often not the 0, not 0 or 1. Often it will be a fraction or an irrational number. Hence, perhaps part of the reason for calling this fractal geometry or fractional geometry, maybe? Okay, so there's the calculation for box dimension. And it's a nice dimension in terms of practical calculations because you can often work these numbers out quite explicitly. I think we can do this for our cantor set, our middle third cantor set. Okay, how many intervals of size? less than or equal to 3 to the minus n are going to be required to cover the cantor set. Well, we can use the intervals that come up in the cantor set construction at step n in the construction. Those 2 to the n intervals of length 3 to the minus n. So we certainly don't need more than 2 to the n. Do, could we go get away with any fewer? No. Because if we just think about the left-hand endpoints of those intervals, so those two to the end, left hand endpoints, how far apart are they? Well, if you think about going from one left interval to the next, our, our intervals, we've got the layer length is 3 to the minus n. There's one left endpoint. There's the next one. Then we've got to cross over this gap before we get to the next one. So any two of these left-hand endpoints are at least, or that they're strictly more than 3 to the minus n apart. So we cannot put two of them into one set of size 3 to the minus n. So we're going to have to have at least as many sets in our cover as endpoints, so the left endpoints. So we're going to have to have at least 2 to the n intervals in a 3 to the minus n cover. And so that shows us that in fact, n sub 3 to the minus n is exactly 2 to the n. We can do it with 2 to the n, and we can't do it with less. So plug that into our formula. You have log of 2 to the n in the numerator, absolute value of log of 3 to the minus n in the denominator. So that just simplifies down to log 2 over log 3, which amusingly is approximately 2 thirds. Uh, <coughs> Very tempting, of course, to strike off the logs, but we would never do that. <laughs> so, the box dimension of this cantor set is log 2 over log 3. That's where it works out to be. Now, what about our other cantor sets? These ones with ratio r, the set CR, where we keep the outer r instead of the outer third. Then what happens? Well, it's, we can go with the same arguments. If we want to get intervals of length r to the n that cover this, this cantor set, 2 to the n will do, the ones that come up in step n of the construction. And we can't get away with fewer, because if we just use the left-hand endpoints, they're going to be farther apart than r to the n. So it's going to be exactly 2 to the n. And so when we plug in, what do we get for the box dimension? log 2 over the absolute value of log r. And you notice that log r goes off to minus infinity monotonically as r tends to 0. So absolute value of log r is just increasing, strictly increasing as r drops to 0. So these numbers, log 2 over absolute log r, they are dropping to 0 monotonically as r goes to 0, exactly as we would intuitively think. That as r gets smaller and smaller, the proportion we're keeping each time is smaller and smaller. These sets are getting smaller and smaller. And this is getting measured now by this box dimension. It wasn't measured in any way that we had previously, but now we're seeing this through this more refined way of <coughs> this box dimension. So that's box dimension. Very nice from a point of view of doing calculations. It has some drawbacks. Um, perhaps that limit doesn't exist, although as I said, then we could go with lim soup and lim imp and talk about upper and lower box dimensions, so that's not an overwhelming problem. Although it can be quite interesting to look at sets where the upper and lower box dimensions are different, and some peculiarities do arise. In fact, there are countable sets whose upper box dimension can be strictly positive. 
And that seems very wrong. Countable sets should have dimension zero in any de de decent kind of dimension. So there are some real problems with, with box dimension. And mathematicians prefer the Hausdorff dimension. Much A very good object from a mathematical point of view, but much more complicated to explain. Again, we're going to talk about delta coverings, although this time I'm willing to allow a countable collection of intervals. So we'll say a, a delta covering is set any countable collection of intervals whose union contains the set in question and their lengths are all less than or equal to delta. So like our Cantor intervals at step n, they form a 3 to the minus n covering of the standard Cantor set. Alrighty, so here we go. So all this page is part of the definition explaining how we calculate the Hausdorff dimension, but we don't quite get to it at the end of this page. But here we go. Let's start at the top, and what do we have to do? So for each t between 0 and 1, we're going to calculate this number, h sub delta superscript t of e. Now what do we do? We look at all possible delta coverings of our set. All these sets Countable sets of intervals, ij. We add up the lengths of these intervals, that's what L of the interval means, raise it to the power t. Add those up. So now we have a whole set of numbers here. Many, many, many numbers. We take the infimum of this set. Now all these numbers are greater or equal to zero, so this set is bounded from below, so there is an infimum. You calculate the infimum, and that's called h sub delta of t. Now think about what happens as we decrease delta. You notice that if delta 1 is less than or equal to delta 2, then it's harder to be a delta 1 cover. You're working with smaller sets. It's going to be much harder. And so when delta 1 is smaller than delta 2, there's actually fewer delta 1 covers. So you'd be taking an infimum over a smaller set, and the infimum then can only rise. And that means that these numbers, h sub delta of t, rise as delta decreases. So think of this as having an increasing sequence, h delta, fixed, t is fixed, remember? And we take the limit. It's an increasing sequence, so the limit exists. We're, we're willing to let the limit be plus infinity. So the limit does exist possibly as plus infinity. That is called h sub t, h superscript t of e, this limit. Or because they're rising, it's also the supremum. And this number is known as the Hausdorff t measure of the set e. So that's how we calculate the Hausdorff t measure of a set e. We go through this whole process. And that will always be a number between 0 and infinity. Usually it's 0 or infinity. There are very few choices of t where it's not. Very, very few. Yeah, like 1 or less, as it turns out. OK, so now we think again. We calculate all these numbers ht of e, and we do this for every t between 0 and 1. What happens as we increase t? As we increase t, these lengths to the power t will be going, getting smaller and smaller. Because these lengths are very small numbers. So when we raise them to bigger and bigger powers, they just shrink more and more. So these sums that come up in this calculation here, they are decreasing as t increases. And so that means that these numbers, h subscript delta superscript t, they are decreasing as t increases. And so the same holds when you pass to the limit. h t of e decreases as t increases. So what typically happens here, I've tried to plot it for you, the values of h, t of e for a given set e. Here's how they, they change as t runs across the interval 0, 1. They start out at plus infinity. And they stay at plus infinity for a while. 
I wasn't quite sure how to graph plus infinity.